Hello, everybody. My name is Sadhana Devaraja, and I'm Managing Director at Health Begins. And just want to thank you all for joining us at Health Begins and our partners on this webinar titled Health Equity Zones, Opportunities for Plans, Providers, and States to Align and Advance Health Equity by Place. So before we start, um, we would like you to know that this webinar will be recorded and we'll be sending an edited version of this recording out to registrants after the webinar. Um, all participant lines um, should be on mute. Um, if you, you have a question for us, you can enter it at any time in the chat window. We have reserved time at the end of the webinar to answer all of the questions that come in through chat. Um, and to test out the chat, if you'd like, please just take a moment to tell us who you are, your organization, and where you're logging in from. And we'll be able to all see that. This, this presentation is scheduled to last us for one hour. And before we dive into the content, I would like to, um, one, remind folks to um, tweet us as well in, as the chat. So you see our handles on the screen there at Health Begins, at HealthNet, and at uh, Rhode Island Health, RI Health. Um, and that's uh, representing all the speakers on the call today. And please bring and share respect, curiosity, and joy for today's session. We go to the next slide, I can um, jump in and kind of introduce our speakers for today. We're so thrilled to have this great um, panel today. So I'll be joining uh, Sadhana Devraja as the host, and we will be joined by Chris Ashura, who's the Director of Equity Operations and the Acting Co-Director of the Health Equity Institute for the Rhode Island Department of Health. Um, also, Dr. Pooja Mittal, Vice President and Chief Health Equity Officer of HealthNet, and Dr. Rishi Manchanda, CEO of Health Begins. So looking forward to the discussion that we have ahead of us today. To go to the next slide, just wanted to remind folks a little bit of our mission at Health Begins. So Health Begins, we drive radical transformation and health equity. And we do this by helping courageous leaders in healthcare community and also our public health partners move upstream um, and by improving the structural and social drivers of health equity for patients, communities, and society. And we're just so excited to be thrilled by some of these courageous leaders today, um, both presenting on the call as well as all of you in the audience. So looking forward to your engagement, your questions, your enthusiasm, um, your skepticism as we go through the, the session today um, and really dive in on that first piece of structural and social drivers of health equity. If you go to the next slide, these are the learning objectives for today. So we hope um, you'll all join us in addressing these questions and that by the end together, uh, we'll be able to know you know, how do we define health equity zones and um, starting off with how states are using the approach of health equity zones to um, deliver their work. Think about how health plans are taking that concept and then applying it to improve outcomes for members. And then for all of us to apply an understanding of health equity zones to our own work, you know, taking that adaptation and, and making it work for us and our societies and our communities. Before we get into the how-to of this and um, listen to some of our panelists talk about how they've been grappling with health equity zones and adaptations of it, wanted to take kind of a high level, kind of like a macro level to kick us off. First to level sit, and this frame would be familiar to many of you who have joined us before um, and joined Health Begin sessions before, to think of the three levels of of inequities and equities related to health. So um, we raise this here. There's the individual level, social risk factors and social needs um, as kind of the most micro. There's this meso level of community level social determinants of health that we're often talking about. These are some of the examples we might see here are food deserts. Um, and then the macro level of structural determinants of health equity. And these are um, higher level considerations, supermarket redlining, structural racism. And what reason I'm raising this here and why we're positing here is what we're talking about are these community level and societal levels. We're kind of between the meso and the macro in our discussion today. Um, and talking about, you know, not interventions aimed at health promotion behaviors. We're not talking necessarily about individual level um, factors, but really looking at um, health equity zones and how they can be applied um, towards the, the macro levels of this frame. I also wanted to raise in, in the next slide um, the 
importance of place within this. So when we're looking at structural determinants of health equity, and we're looking at these meso levels um, and looking at race in particular, we know that inequities are shaped by these social and structural drivers. These are the social arrangements, the practices, and the structural forms of violence that are putting people in harm's way. And we know that these inequities are geographically distributed. As a result though, liberation movements are also situated by place in response to this, right? Um, and that's true for almost all liberation movements. So what does that mean in the context of opportunities in healthcare? It means that we can contribute to liberation through more free geographies. And we can use the power that we wield to be able to dismantle some of these organized, um, we kind of talk about it as geographically distributed, but it's also organized abandonment of people and environments. And so wanted to posit this at the top of our call, just to kind of um, expand the way that we think about um, why we're doing this place-based um, inquiry and why place-based inquiries matter. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I want to kind of leave this introduction section with just a quote from Ruth Wilson Gilmore about examining place. And I'll let you folks read it, but it's really urging us to think about not just going to a place to understand it, but to think about the connectedness of place, to think about how they're purposefully um, invested in, how they're purposely forgotten, and that this is really driven by people like the folks on this call today and through the institutions um, that deliver these types of um, connectedness and abandonment. So the question is, can health equity zones pave the way for communities to liberate themselves? And with that, I want to introduce our first presenter, um, Chris Ashura. And so excited to have you on here, Chris. You've um, been such a great, um, thought leader and kind of partner. And I know at Health Begins, we've benefited from your thinking and doing um, through many of our products, our, our blogs, and um, just really excited to have you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, very tall order to, to answer that question. I, I do hope that the work that we're doing at least sets the tone that um, the approach to looking at health through the lens of place uh, it, it is possible. Uh, whether or not we can fundamentally change in short order, I think is going to be the collective work of all of us. But please do jump to the next slide. So the work that we've been doing here in Rhode Island to establish the Health Equity Zone Initiative really is built out of the foundational understanding of everything that Sedana just said, which is you know, really health begins outside of the clinical setting. Um, obviously, you need very good clinical care um, to support population health and individual health outcomes, but really what's determining and defining the health outcomes of the population are things that are happening in the places where people live, work, play, and pray. Um, please, next slide. So because of that, uh, and really grounded in that understanding that the, the place where people live and the place where people interact with has such a profound impact on health, we've been looking at this intersection of uh, both demographic and geographic implications in population health outcomes really for the past two decades here in Rhode Island. Um, prior to the, the launch of the Health Equity Zone Initiative and the Health Equity Zone Framework, we had a number of different uh, initiatives or approaches to really trying to shift our thinking and shift our implementation to the realm of doing work in this space. And two key learnings came out of that work. Really the first was that the community infrastructure that's necessary to do this work in alignment with the change trajectory that exists to really achieve the goals that have been laid out here today, it's just not there. Um, there is a significant amount of resource and energy that has been invested, but much of it is in programmatic or outcome-based uh, strategies, not really in the framework and the infrastructure necessary to achieve the type of change that we're talking about. Uh, you know, the second really is that you cannot just target one individual or one particular social environmental condition as one of the prior slides illustrated. You really have to think about what are the structural underpinnings within those particular geographies or within those particular communities that are creating that prevalence of that social and environmental condition uh, within that particular geography. Food access is a great example of this in that, you know, just doing a two, three year intervention at increasing accessibility and affordability of food in a particular geography is not gonna change food insecurity for that particular community. You may treat a symptom, but you're not gonna address the underlying challenges that exist within that, that, that community. 
Um, so in 2015, we launched the Health Equity Zone Initiative in earnest, really built upon those learnings that we needed to make an inv intentional investment in the infrastructure of communities to empower communities to address social and environmental conditions at the root. Uh, and to do that, we needed a totally different and fundamentally um, new way of doing public health investing. Next slide, please. So really the HES initiative, as it boils down to the core, is, is based on this concept of health equity. It's, it's a recognition that the community both understands what the issues are and has the solutions to those challenges within the community. We need to then support the community in, in creating that change. It's that the place makes a difference. Um, we also understand, obviously, that there are differences between demographic populations and geographic populations, but we see this as the sort of first slice, understanding that regardless of the demographic, geographic proximity has a fundamental implication on, on the, the health equity of a community or the ability to achieve equity and the health outcomes of the people who live there. Um, it needs to be community led. This needs to stop being top down work. We need to stop telling the community what their problems are and rather listen to the community, um, both in what their needs are, but also what the solutions are. And finally, this needs to be focused on the social and environmental determinants, not just looking at the uh, conditions and the outcomes that we're trying to change from a public health perspective, things such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Uh, the model has really remained the same through three fairly extensive iterations. Now we have three cohorts of the Health Equity Zone Initiative here in Rhode Island, um, but the foundation is really the same. The first piece is that the community self-identifies and self-selects a geography. We do not come in and say, here's what the data has borne out. This is where you need this intervention because this is the priority. Uh, similar interventions or similar approaches will come to the work with this concept of this is the problem that we are trying to solve. Um, we see that as being incredibly valuable. However, it tends to become a means to an end solution versus the solution itself being that we want to invest in community capacity. So we start using this operational equity framework, which says that the community should self-define the geography in which they want to be representing. Um, the other issue that we, we have noticed we've been able to solve with this is that we are not defining geographic boundaries and very frequently the demographic populations in a geography will straddle the traditional political or geographic boundaries that you would see on a map. So the only conditions that we put on that community is that there's 5,000 individuals, that that is a contiguous geographic area, meaning that you can't cherry pick parts of a neighborhood and exclude the rest of it. Um, and that there has to be some sort of measurable inequity or disparity, but to be frank, that's everywhere in the state of Rhode Island. Um, as those folks identify that place, they then apply to the Department of Health for some resources. Um, we are currently supporting those uh, health equity zones with about $150,000 a year of core infrastructure funding, and they go through a one-year development process that starts off their journey as a health equity zone. And this is what that process looks like. Folks come together to build a collective or a collaborative. This is bringing together the power players within the community, both the residents as well as the leaders within that particular geography. What we don't want are people from outside of a community reaching in and saying, we're gonna solve the problems for these people. We want the leaders and the residents of that community to come together, build their own collective. What this also does is it brings together those multiple streams of work that are currently happening, that are outcome focused and gives them the ability to have conversations collectively in a partnership. That collective then conducts an assessment of the needs and assets within that particular geography looking at what's good, what's not good, what can be improved. And then they take that information back to the community. As I said before, we provide 12 months of time for folks to do this work and intentionally really create that extra space and time to check back in with residents, to have that conversation and say, here's what we heard from you. Is this right? Did we get it right? And if we did get it right, what do you really care about? Not what does the health department care about? Not what does the funder care about? But what do you as the residents care about? That then transcends into this plan of action. Um, the plan of action or action plan is essentially the foundation of all the work that we're doing to establish this equity framework within a community. The idea being that the community then decides and, de and determines and defines, this is what's really important to us. This is where we're gonna build from. And these are the things that we hope to change. We then support those folks over the course of five years of contracting, but in an investment that we conceive as in perpetuity, meaning that we do not intend to pull back these resources ever to implement interventions to achieve outcomes and then to evaluate those outcomes. 
This becomes incredibly complex and complicated considering the fact that many of the evaluation methodologies as well as the funding streams are not well aligned with what the priorities are of the community, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide, please. So this just gives an idea of what a health equity zone collaborative looks like. A uh, few things I'd like to call attention to in this slide are the breadth of different types of organizations that are participating in this work. Some of these folks are funded, some of these folks aren't funded, um, but really they come to the table as representatives of the community or people who have a vested interest in the place that they're working in or the place that they are serving. Um, you will also notice that inside that central bubble, there's not an organization. There's not one single group that's leading this work. It is the collective itself that is the nebulous or the hub of all of what happens in this particular area. And although there is what we refer to as a fiduciary agent or backbone model, um, that is not the lead. That is just one supporting organization within the overall structure. And the structure itself is supposed to be or intended to be uh, really driving the conversation from the community up. Next slide, please. As I referred to before, there are some inherent challenges here in a health department supporting this work because the health department receives health department funding. Um, but really our theory of change is that by developing this operational equity foundation, the sustainable community infrastructure that can continue to iterate and grow and, and, and build upon their understanding of what the real needs of the community are and put the cart back behind the horse, right? Instead of it being top down and saying that the priority is coming from the funder, it's coming from the bottom up and the community is able to represent what their actual needs are and starts to build the capacity to implement change. Our responsibility as the state health agency and in partnership with our, our sister agency, as well as the philanthropic and federal funders that support this, this important work is to listen and to align the resources that we have available to us, not just as the health department, but as our subsidiary or as our collective partners, aligning our resources behind what the needs are of the community. And then to establish evaluative methodologies, to understand the efficacy of this new approach. This is non-traditional. This is not how the money and the investment traditionally flows. Um, and we understand that to try to layer on evidence best, best practice evaluation methodology onto an equity framework where every single community is being treated differently is inherently challenging. Next slide, please. So what does this look like now here in Rhode Island? Right now we have 15 health equity zones that are covering approximately 85% of the population here in the state. We have 300 organizations who are actively collaborating, but our collaborator list of folks that are involved or participating is over a thousand at this point. And we have 20 unique sectors represented that run the gamut from uh, criminal justice, private industry, um, multiple state government agencies and federal funders, philanthropic partners, um, cities and towns, municipal governments, uh, pretty much I would say most of the movers and shakers in the state at this point are somehow connected to a health equity zone within their particular community. I also want to call attention from a political standpoint, the importance that we've heard from our, uh, our representatives, both at the state and federal level, of how important it is for them and how helpful this has been for them to hear directly from residents in the community, how this has given a voice to people who typically are not part of the conversation. Next slide, please. So what do we do at the state and how do we support this work? We really look at this as that there are four key sectors for the work that we're doing that really have foundationally shaped the way that we approach our relationship with the community. The first is that we are, we are laser focused on the development and sustainability of strong community collaboratives. We recognize that collaboration is, uh, it, it goes against the grain of how community investment typically works where folks are competing against each other. And we understand that that is a challenge, there's governance issues, there are issues of restorative justice that need to be dealt with. Quite frankly, um, understanding our relationship as a state government agency and the power we bring to the table in that conversation has been profoundly challenging, but also a huge opportunity for growth. So we work collectively to provide both informal and formal TA, not just from the state down, but in providing resources to community organizations who are doing this work really well within the network to educate each other in this culture of learning that we've created. The second is around fiscal accountability. Uh, nothing really can happen if the money's not being spent in ways that are compliant. And we understand and we recognize that. We also realize that there are significant capacity issues within community-based organizations related to financing and, and fiscal oversight. So we provide support from the state down. We also, as part of the contingency in the funding with that backbone, 
model require the backbone fiduciary agent to provide support to the partners within the community who may be smaller community nonprofits with the intention that we're building a stronger network of CBOs in each of the communities that we're working with. The next is around programmatic implementation and recognizing that it's essential for us to be able to follow through on the things that we've committed to do. And we work with those folks in that final phase, which is around evaluation performance management, to really redefine the conversation, not to report back that your programming is going fine, or here are the process measures that we've collected, but to rethink that relationship and understand how do we create meaningful KPI to understand when it's not working? And how do we work together in partnership, moving out of that compliance-based model that typically works from the state funder down to understand if the community is struggling with something, if one of our partners is not able to get the work done, how do we provide that support to ensure that they're able to succeed? Next slide, please. So we get the question a lot of how do we pay for this and how do we make this work? I want to start by saying that there was not a direct federal investment or allocation from any philanthropic partner to start this work or to continue to do it. Um, I do think that there is an inherent value in the fact that we have braided together the resources to make this work. But I also want to give a lot of credit to our partners at the, at the federal, state, and philanthropic level for their willingness and, and, and support and flexibility in allowing us to take funds that were appropriated to do social determinants of health or health equity work and really explore this framework. Um, it is, uh, without saying, it would not be possible without their support, but I do wanna be clear that they did not give us a direct allocation to do this. And in fact, what we did was take resources that were intended to go into the community, braid them together with other resources uh, to make sure that we had adequate funding to support the work that's being done. Um, as the previous slide illustrated, we do not have all of the money to fix everything that the community has identified. Um, but what we do is we leverage what we do have to create the infrastructure in that baseline framework. Um, we have multiple Department of Health staff who are working on this at this point. The team is just about 12 people who are directly uh, full time working on the initiative. And we have about 22 different funding streams that come from inside and outside of the health department to support these initiatives. Uh, and the work that happens in the community. Next slide, please. And the final slide I wanted to leave folks with is very confusing looking, but pretty simple <laughs> in what it hopes to articulate. Uh, this is intended to show the challenge that communities face as they pursue, receive, and execute um, community investments, whether they be public health investments, philanthropic investments, it, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, it creates a boom and bust cycle. And each of the colored lines that you see here are meant to indicate a grant cycle. So you receive funding, you do some scaling up work, you do some implementation, and then you do your grant closeout. And then hopefully you get some overlapping funding to continue work. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But the reality is that each of these cycles starts a process and then closes a process. What does not happen is that momentum is not contained or are not continued. One of the key things that we seek to do with the Health Equity Zone funding is to create a baseline amount of resources, that $150,000 a year that I initially spoke about, that creates that sustainability, creates the momentum. And then we layer resources on. And the idea here is that we're trying to build capacity. We're trying to empower the community, but build that infrastructure. And <clears throat> by doing this, what we're able to see and what we're beginning to see and the data is starting to bear out is that one, our investment, so the health department investment and the resources that flow directly through this contract start to decline. But what starts to increase is the number of different awards and awards that are aligned with what the community priorities are that the community then begins to receive. We are working with our partners who are also community investors to really understand how do we get other folks to think like this? How do we create this baseline amount of core infrastructure funding at the geographic level so that regardless of whether the priority of the day is COVID or monkeypox or heart disease or hypertension or criminal justice reform or housing, that there is a sustained momentum for people in the community to work together and that the capacity and the infrastructure in the community is there to do that important work. And I will cede the floor because I understand that I'm running out of time, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Chris. That was wonderful. And so many questions are bubbling up for me as it is for our participants. You're really um, tapped into everyone's curiosity. So we'll uh, make sure we leave space at the end for questions. Um, but before we do, 
so excited to introduce Dr. Mittal, um, who we've had the pleasure of working with here at Health Begins, and we'll turn it right over to you. Thanks so much, Sadna. Um, there you go. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sadna. Really, really um, appreciate you all having me today. And I'm really excited to talk about how we are taking this concept and applying it here at HealthNet um, and really thinking about, you know, our, our biggest challenge with this work is going, going to be scaling. And so that's what I'm going to focus a little bit on as, as I talk through this. Next slide, please. So uh, just to give you all some context about HealthNet, HealthNet is California's um, longest serving Medicaid partner. We are um, in 30 plus counties for Medicaid and then 58 counties for all of our different types of business. And we have about 2 million um, members in Medi-Cal. And what you'll see with this map, I think that stands out to me is the diversity of geography that um, is part of our plan. And so when we think about trying to develop place-based work it is very different what we're doing in Los Angeles or um, San Diego County or Imperial County versus the rural North. And so just want to set that stage as, as we move forward and we talk about one of the initiatives that, um, that we've been working on here that is really um, a, sort of derived from the work that Chris has been doing in Rhode Island around health equity improvement zones. Next slide. So when we look at our process overall, this um, health equity improvement model process includes us starting with analyzing multiple sources of data. And we take this data and really align with what we are um, what we are having to do for the state as well, because the state, you know, in California, we're very lucky. There's a lot of stuff going on right now around health equity and Medicaid reform. And so the state is really requiring us to align with equity metrics and quality as well, which helps to sort of power this, power this work. Um, we then do a literature review, really identify best practices based on the particular disparity that we've identified and start to build partnerships or um, leverage existing partnerships with an anchor CBO to start aligning those stakeholders within the community and start to empower the community. After that, we really design the initiative um, based on the needs of the community and incorporate local perspectives on the population's who are impacted by those disparities. So we target both um, our member-facing, um, community-facing, and provider-facing levels for intervention. And then we um, implement and evaluate. So part of what we're looking at doing as we start to build out more and more of these zones is to create what we are ca calling community um, impact councils, which will be um, very mirroring, mirroring very much what Chris is doing, which is creating these sustainable uh, partnerships within the community that will hopefully continue long after the funding that we've initially provided as seed funding um, and will continue to work within the community to improve care and to improve outcomes. Next slide. So when we look at the program and overview for this particular initiative, next slide. We're calling this the Kern County Neighborhood Initiative. So uh, this is a place-based health equity initiative really designed to improve HEDIS measures, reduce disparities in particularly high blood pressure and diabetes management in our Black and Latino populations. The initiative will also focus on um, social determinants of health and also um, identify and solve for barriers to accessing care. It's a multi-year initiative that's a partnership between Quest for Health Equity or Quest Diagnostics, Centene Corporation, which is our parent corporation, and then HealthNet. And because this is a neighborhood-driven initiative, the priority needs and interventions will be determined by the neighborhood, for the neighborhood, and then de developed with support from the Anchor CBO, which sort of helps to address some of those um, power issues, which we know as a big corporation working with folks on the ground, it's, you know, there's a huge differential in power there. And we try and mitigate that by um, feeding that power to really have a local CBO that is um, part of the community based in the community and knows the community be the one to really take the lead in that interaction. And the selected neighborhoods are various zip codes within Bakersfield County, which is um, part of, uh, in Bakersfield, California, which is part of Kern County. Next slide. 
When we take a look at um, this particular initiative, um, we're looking at certain hotspots and zip codes and neighborhoods that we think will have the biggest impact on health outcomes. And we're still in the stages of creating the pilot programs because we're, we're really still um, recruiting the anchor CBO to work with local community members. And so we don't have yet a set of design interventions, but our planning or as we think about these things, we really want to encourage from a community perspective, local, local activation, right? So that um, the priorities are developed and owned by the folks living in the neighborhood, that we're aligning with people's social needs as well, um, and that we are leveraging existing programs to try and help reduce disparities. And then also partnering with providers, right? Because providers are a key part of reducing health disparities, and they also are um, embedded within the community and um, have influence on how, on how we can improve these disparities. Next slide. So um, in terms of local activation, our goal is that those living in the neighborhood will identify and prioritize the need with the support of the CBO that will play a community organizer type role. Once that strategy is developed, um, HealthNet provides seed funding to be able to um, implement the first phase of the project, which will, be, which will go over the course of 18 to 24 months. And then we will support continued funding um, sources or looking for funding opportunities that can help um, support further interventions going forward. And when we look at um, social determinants partnerships, we like to activate as much as possible local social determinants or social um, needs resources, right? So um, partnering with food banks and schools to serve as hubs to support some of this work, um, ensuring that we can partner with workforce development programs as, as needed or as required within the neighborhood, and then also um, coordinate with our local public health departments and the city in terms of supporting other needs that might come up that would um, that address other health issues or other social needs. Next slide. Next slide. So when we take a look at the neighborhood, um, this is um, an, an area that is uh, has a lot of health inequities. This is right where five splits off um, into 99, and that area has, is sort of divided into north and south or east and west Bakersfield as well. Next slide, and we can show you some of the disparities that we've identified there. So when we look at north versus south, these are the zip codes that we are looking at. And we've seen that the lowest performing neighborhoods um, are um, in these zip codes. And the two uh, initiatives that we're focusing on are CBP, which is the blood pressure control, and um, the CDC, which is the diabetes control measures. Next slide. So this slide shows the disparity between the west side of Bakersfield and the east side of Baker Bakersfield in terms of performance for CBP and CDC. All of Kern overall, um, just uh, taking a step back, is low performing for both of these measures. Um, and our graphs don't even show the minimum performance level, right, because we're below that on both of these. Um, and we've also seen pretty significant decreases in both of these measures with um, COVID and in Kern and also in other counties in California. So we've seen generally that these heat measures have had lower performance over the last two years. Next slide. When we take a look at this slide, it really shows us the breakdown of race, ethnicity, and um, CBP and CDC performance in North and South Bakersfield. So if we take a look at um, our black members, they perform better in um, the diabetes measure in the Northeast, much, but much worse than um, Latino or white members um, in the blood pressure control. And then the Southeast Bakersfield shows the same trend with the diabetes control. But in general, you can see all, all members are not performing as well. So um, the denominators on the left show you the number of people by race and ethnicity. It, can, it gives you a sense of how many people are in each neighborhood in each, um, in each bucket. But essentially what we see is that there are significant disparities right, between um, the different areas and also by race and ethnicity. Slide. 
And then this, um, yeah, not surprising to, to any of us, but um, just, I think, backs up what we think about and what we see generally is that people who are housing insecure um, perform worse on these HEDIS measures or have worse um, outcomes in terms of these measures as compared to people who are housing secure. And um, that also correlates with race. You can see how low the, um, the CBP measure is or the blood pressure measure is for Black um, housing insecure folks in Southeast Bakersfield. It's under 5%, so super low. Next slide. So um, just wanted to bring this up because it's our, how our quality team sort of approaches the, the beginning of how to start thinking through what what um, solutioning might be. Um, we use the what works recommended strategies and um, none of these will come as a surprise to all of you, but patient shared decision-making, um, value-based insurance design, uh, community health worker support, so health navigation support, and then financial incentives for preventative care. And so we share these, um, these that we learn with our community partners, with providers, and um, try and provide support in terms of resourcing and potential interventions that may support um, so that we can provide that sort of support of a health plan without sort of forcing any particular, um, any particular solution. I think, I think that's the end of my slides. I'll just come back to, um, before I hand it over to Rashid, just, um, I'll just come back to um, that we really um, have done this type of work in pockets all over California. Um, and had to find those communities um, by various things, sometimes zip code, as you can see in this initiative, sometimes um, by clinic, clinic area or clinic population or race ethnicity population that's concentrated in one area. But the, the real challenge is how to scale this work statewide and to do it in a way that we're still being sensitive to the individual needs of the community. I'll hand it back to you, Sadma. Thank you so much, Pooja. That was wonderful. And it's um, so exciting to see discreetly how you've taken the concepts of Health Equity Zone and applied it to the work that you're doing at HealthNet and inspiring as well. Um, I would like to turn it over to Rishi Manchanda now. And I think we'll still have time for questions at the very end. So please keep um, putting in your questions while Rishi kind of uh, ties a bow on some of the presentations we've heard today. Thanks, Adana, and thanks to Pooja and to Chris um, as well for just an incredible, uh, really diverse kind of um, conversation right now from the perspective of both the state as well as the health plan. And, and it's actually just um, an opportunity for me to perhaps share some reflections on what uh, we at Health Begins have been seeing because we have this really uh, wonderful privilege to work uh, and learn from vanguards uh, at the state level, like uh, Chris and the team at the Rhode Island Department of Health, and also vanguards and courageous leader, lead, leaders in, in Medicaid health plans like Pooja and um, many health systems. Because of that, I think there's a couple of uh, quick reflections, um, and, and I'll be brief so we can open this up for dialogue. Uh, this is just coming back to, I think, the point that Sadhana, you mentioned at the top, and that's the importance of place. And, and this, this what occurs to me as I was listening to both Chris and Pooja, you, the both of you speak was, um, of course, this now incredible recognition that I think is becoming widespread of not just um, what health equity means, but what is shaping health inequity, the social and structural drivers, uh, and the awareness, of course, now um, more dominant, perhaps more widespread across um, healthcare policymakers, and that is that these social and structural drivers of health inequities are geographically distributed, they're spatialized. Um, and so if, if social and structural drivers of health inequities, if equity itself is a geographic phenomenon and if it's spatialized, then the way that health systems and payers um, need to respond to improving health inequities must also be place-based. Um, I, I think that's something that's uh, the high level takeaway for me as I was listening to the Vanguard work that you're each representing here today. And as we think about that, especially uh, when it comes to the experience that many health systems and payers have, we also acknowledge from our vantage point that many health systems and many payers haven't organized themselves internally to align with this place-based understanding um, in a way that um, is being exemplified by um, what Pooja and Chris are talking about today. At the same time, there are a lot of place-based cross-sector strategies that have emerged in the past uh, decade or more across uh, the country um, from Accountable Communities for Health, and you see a diagram here on the right um, from the Commonwealth Fund describing some ways to measure the health equity, equity impact of various different types of Accountable Communities for Health 
There are models like the purpose-built communities, which have been very focused specifically on racial equity, communities of opportunity, um, experiences, for example, in Seattle, where that model for place-based cross-sector work has been applied to improve equity. Uh, and then other initiatives like the SPARC model as well. There are a variety of incredible examples of place-based cross-sector strategies, and many of them, especially in the past few years, have been focusing more and more laser-like on how to leverage those place-based cross-sector strategies to be able to target specific inequities. Um, and of course, like many, well, many of them have been supported by philanthropy uh, with some braiding of federal and or local government support. What I think makes the work that Chris, you described so notable is that now you have states now entering um, and demonstrating at the, at, that states, whether it's the departments of public health or state Medicaid agencies can also play a role in promoting these kind of place-based community-driven uh, cross-sector approaches as well. And so these macro level strategies raise this question that I think Pooja, you were answering really wonderfully. And what, what does it mean then for health plans and health systems? I think what's what we're seeing in Health Begins is clearly there are opportunities for health systems and health plans, especially medically managed care organizations to at least play a role in supporting and participating in state led health equity zones like the ones that Chris described in Rhode Island and as we see in other states as well. If those exist in your state, if your state is at the beginning of that process, how can you as a health system, how can you as a plan play a role in supporting? And I, by support, I should be explicit. How can you contribute funding to support and mitigate some of the, the, the boom and bust type of funding cycles um, that can be a challenge for these place-based approaches? Um, that external opportunity, I think, exists more and more now across the country. At the same time, though, there is also a lot of internal opportunity, and this is what we are seeing kind of come to life with the way that Pooja, you're leading some of the system transformation internally within HealthNet. Within plans and health systems, is there an opportunity to analyze your own data, right, to identify geographic patterns of inequity, to then align resources internally, your teams, departments, et cetera, as well as your partnerships using place as a central organizing principle, and then, of course, to act um, to eliminate both member level inequities as well as these community level inequities using um, targeted improvement efforts um, that that raise up the principles that Chris outlined about community driven um, approaches. We, we think this, this approach to analyze, align and, and act are really some of the key kind of uh, ways to address some of the challenges um, that are out there. And there are many and I, we can come back to this perhaps if there's time, Southern, so I won't um, belabor this point. But I think what we're certainly seeing is that a lot of plans many of which aspire to address equity, not just at a member level, but address the social and structural drivers of equity, of inequity by place, that they still need help to do that and help in prioritizing populations um, and performance measures by place, uh, coordinating staff, now realigning kind of how committees work and work groups come together internally around place based understandings of inequity, and then how to align incentives as well as payments, including value-based payment models to center equity and support these internal efforts, as well as these external state-led efforts to create health equity zones. Uh, scaling, so, uh, as Pooja, you mentioned, clearly is a challenge here. And I, we think there are opportunities, and you know, I, I'll, um, I'll just screen share really briefly that when we've seen how this is coming together, where plans now and systems can learn from states in the way that Rhode Island has demonstrated so wonderfully about this health equity zone model, I think there are a few different steps. The analyze includes starting with just understanding your data and um, understanding how to filter and analyze that data, stratify that data to identify inequities, particularly racial inequities, and then geocode that data to identify specific areas, including census tracts, how to then align uh, internal resources. And there are various steps that um, can help to bring internal department heads from quality improvement to population health management um, utilization management and um, provider relations. There's a whole variety of teams that exist within health plans and similarly within health systems that often aren't coming together to think about problems by place and then to align the resources by place. And this is an opportunity to start to do just that. And finally, then to act. Um, and there's a, this is a busy slide with a lot of different steps on it, but the takeaway is how do you then start to implement um, SMART goals, uh, design SMART goals and then implement them uh, using not just member level strategies, which is what a lot of plans do, or patient level strategies, which is what the health systems do, but strategies where you can where you can lead to improve outcomes for patients and members, and then play your role as a partner to support community driven efforts um, 
to address the meso and macro level um, drivers of those inequities in the first place. So there's a variety of steps and we're seeing, I think, uh, a lot of opportunity here um, for health plans and in particular, as well as health systems, especially those that serve Medicaid beneficiaries um, to be able to now take a page from um, and learn a lot from states like Rhode Island and start thinking now about how place can be a central organizing mechanism to finally get to, to finally address one of the original sins in American healthcare, and that is that we have decoupled healthcare from place. This is an opportunity to kind of think to start to rectify um, that issue um, using the health equity zone model really as an animating principle. So then I'll turn it back to you. Uh, as you can tell, I'm pretty excited about this. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And I'm um, wondering, thank you so much for everyone who's been uh, introducing questions in the chat as well. And so I think where we'll start, we received a ton of questions through this um, throughout the webinar, where I kind of want to start is some initial questions that came up at the front um, around what is it about this approach that is different than the current way we work. So some folks in the chat talked about CHNAs at nonprofit hospitals um, and other kind, and Rishi mentioned in his presentation, other types of place-based uh, work that's taking place. So um, I want to ask our presenters, you know, how is this approach better, different than the current way we've been working? And if it's possible, you know, thinking through what does this help unlock um, for future work in your perspective? So maybe I'll, I'll ask Chris that question first about the differentiator for health equity zones and kind of what it what it unlocks, the path you see forward for it. I'll, I'll couch this and I'm a little biased. <laughs> I've spent nearly a decade of my life to investing and in standing this up in partnership with our, our secretary of uh, HHS here. Um, I, without getting too uh, romantic about it, it really is a fundamental change in how we approach the relationship between uh, the funder and, and the priority and the community. Um, too frequently, we make the community work for the money versus making the money work for the community. And the only way for us to understand how to make the resources that are available work for the people who are being impacted is to listen. And you can't listen if there's nowhere to go to have that conversation. And that was really what we found was that, you know, when we went to have these very, very complicated conversations around structural design and, you know, why is this community for the last 40, I mean, Rhode Island's an old state, 40, 50, 60 years, seeing the same disparities in, in similar outcomes, whether it be economic mobility, graduation rates, teenage pregnancy, chronic disease, um, what is driving this? And two things really sprung up. The first was, you know, there just wasn't a place to have that conversation. There weren't people who were coming together to talk about those things in sort of the way that you would think. Um, and I think I will say that from the healthcare or sort of the public sector side, you know, we have those discussions. We have spaces to have those conversations. Um, the community was being resourced to focus on very specific interventions that were very transactional versus transformational. Um, and then the second really was the capacity and infrastructure to do something about it. And many of these things, um, you know, I, I briefly mentioned uh, that the change trajectory is incredibly challenging here. You know, you're trying to change structural racism. That's not something that, that is going to happen in a year or in two years or in three years. It's not something that putting $50,000 out is going to create that change. So there needs to be a fundamental shift in the way that we, we interact and the way that those conversations happen. And there needs to be an alignment with, again, that change trajectory and the reality of how, you know, um, entrenched those issues are and how complicated those issues are to unpack. But if we really want to work with the community, if we really want to do equity work, we have to make the investment in the capacity in the communities to do that kind of work. And, you know, for us, that's, that's the big difference, right? It's creating that space to have those discussions, to have those conversations, to build the capacity up uh, in, in really the side of the house that is chronically underinvested in so that we can start to do that work. We see it as, you know, a space for the healthcare sector to plug into the community when we look at that 85 to 15%, you know, the 80% is chronically underinvested in. And the health system and, and you know, really the government sector relies on that capacity at the community level that just frankly doesn't exist. Uh, we see this as a beachhead not as a, it, we're not there yet. We haven't achieved it. We haven't solved health equity. We've demonstrated that it is like literally possible to do this work differently. And that's what I think is fundamentally different. 
I love that. And it's, um, I love kind of that framing of not repeating kind of the original sins of the siloed programmatic work and creating that space and capacity. That's wonderful. I saw Pooja, you nodding, and I'm so curious to hear your take on what uh, the different opportunities that help equity improvement zones present for you. Yeah, I think it allows us to become hyper local in our approach to issues that we know vary by community and region and allow us to co-create solutions with the real experts um, on, on what needs to be done to actually improve health for the entire community. I think, you know, as a health plan, we're always focused on our members' health, but part of what we do as, um, as we contribute to this type of work is we don't just uplift our own members' health, we uplift the entire health of the community, and that has generational impact, right? And so I, I also think that by doing this work in health equity zones, it allows us to start to shift the culture within the community because the community is really invested in the work. And that allows for a different type of sustainability. It, you know, it sort of gives people this um, self-efficacy, which I think is critical when we're thinking about improving health equity. I love that. Thank you, Pooja. I don't know, Rishi, if you had any comments um, that you would want to add on kind of what you see as unlocking through the development of, of these types of place-based structures. Before I go to the next question. Yeah, I, I think I think what what's really unlocking, I think, and and Chris and Pooja both put your resonated with deeply with me, which is you're, you're demonstrating that a different way of of operating is possible here, a transformational way rather than just transactional, and that really resonates in part because it it means that we're starting to recognize a that structures and systems cause harm, generational harm, right, and they manifest in these inequities. And therefore, to counter those structures and systems, we need infrastructure, right, to, to essentially promote equity. You know, how do we counter structures that cause harm? Well, we need infrastructure uh, and not just programs and, you know, just another menu of interventions um, that, as you said, um, Chris, uh, you know, where the, the community is working for the money. So I think that really resonates with me, like, how do we counter structures that cause harm with infrastructure? And I think what's what's resoundingly clear is that is that that infrastructure has to be place place based, um, and that means that it's not just um, relevant for what a public health department is doing or a state is doing. It has direct strategic, operational, administrative, and financial implications for health plans and for health systems. Right, that um, are increasingly being asked to now answer the questions of equity. Um, so. If health plans and health systems are saying they're about equity, but they're not thinking about place and organizing themselves to support place based efforts in the way that we're seeing manifest here, then the question really is, are they really advancing equity or are they just doing it with a, a very basic nascent sense of what that means? It's time to get, you know, place based. Thanks, Rishi. And I think we might have time for one or two more questions. I'm going to group a couple of the other ones I saw on um, kind of defining community, I know Pooja, you um, answered a bit of this in the chat as well as um, in your remarks, but grouping these questions as, you know, how are you defining community? How are you defining geography? And how are you bringing in um, which stakeholders? So I saw, Chris, while you were presenting questions about businesses and um, other stakeholders, you know, how are you bringing them in? Um, and the same question for you, Pooja, I'll ask Pooja to to answer first, if that's all right. And I also wanted to raise up, I think this is a relevant critique from Bell Davis in the chat as well about including community members in our presentation here today. So thank you for that comment, Val, um, and is something that we should have included um, and appreciate that critique and also um, will be um, considered for future discussions on this topic, which I think will be great. Um, so Pooja, let me turn it to you first to kind of answer those first bucket of questions on community geography. Um, and partners. Yeah, and we do we do overlay a lot of different types of data and and try and identify a community by um, where um, where folks might work together and um, where we see the disparities. So it may sometimes be delineated by zip code. It may actually be delineated. We did this work um, in a small area in the Central Valley, really focused on El Salvadoran women who were um, birthing and um, looking at postpartum follow-up. So it really does vary by what, what the issue is that sort of comes to light and what we're helping to try and solve. Um, and then um, what was the second part of your question, Sadna? I'm sorry. The partnership. So, you know, who are the 
um, how are you defining geography, community, and then um, pulling in partners? Yeah, and the partnerships really do vary again by um, by the problem. So when we were looking at um, trying to improve postpartum follow up for El Salvadoran women, our partners were um, community members, so women who had been pregnant and had not had follow up. So we pulled them in. Um, a pretty significant team on our side with medical directors, population health, um, our communications folks, and our health equity and cultural and linguistics team. And then um, on the provider side, um, people from the provider's organization. Um, when we're looking at the Quest Grant, for example, our main partner um, that we will be working with is an anchor CBO, and they will be recruiting um, members and also um, members of the community and then also other CBOs and subgranting to them. So it really does depend on the type of work. Great, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Chris kind of the same question on, you know, how are you defining communities? How are you defining geographies? And how do you decide kind of which partners to pull in? Um, we don't. <laughs> we, we allow the community to self-select. Uh, they, they determine and they define what the geographic area is. I, I think it's loosely based on um, political boundaries and sort of neighborhood boundaries, historical neighborhood boundaries. We, we don't step in and say that this is the place that this work has to happen or that here are the particular priorities. Um, and, and the rationale for that is, you know, as I've mentioned, frequently it transcends you know, the, the, the geographic def definition of what a community quote unquote is. Um, we have also seen that in some geographic areas that there are multiple communities that are being represented. And sometimes that's multiple geographic communities that are working together in one sort of more macro geography. Um, Central Providence is a great example of this where there are sort of smaller neighborhoods that exist that are all part of one Central Providence Health Equity Zone. So they're working in their particular part of that you know, larger geography, but there's leaders who are resident leaders um, that lead that work in those particular geographic areas. And, and the goal always is that we do not want an outside influence going into a neighborhood and saying, hey, we have the solutions for you, but rather to build the capacity of residents up. And I think that um, you know, what we have found is that where that there is a lot of um, existing community leadership. You know, this model takes off. It's like a wildfire. Where there's not, um, and I will say that one of the questions that came through, I think, directly to me was a question on rural communities. And, you know, this work is, is profoundly hard in rural communities because there's just not the historical investment in, in a lot of the intervention work. Not as many community-based organizations who are doing that kind of work. Um, and there are challenges. What, what we commit to do in our approach is to support the development in these particular self-defined geographies, recognizing that if we want to be at you know, step 100, but the community is at step one, definitely pressure to say get to 100 doesn't help us. Support to build those structures up to get to the place of where the community you know, wants to be and needs to be um, is really the only way for us to effectively and successfully get there. Uh, but with that said, you know, we use a lot of our political power, as you will, to influence other groups and organizations and entities to get to the table. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we see maybe it's a health plan or a provider group or someone who has some level of institutional authority and power who can help and is not engaging, is not taking, um, you know, is not gravitating towards supporting the community. You know, we push. Uh, from whatever angles that we have to encourage them to do that and at times, you know, sometimes require them as a regulator to, to do that kind of work. And that's the structural work that we do behind the scenes. Thank you, Chris. And I appreciate that kind of um, community loving, uh, community driven definition of geography um, as kind of the baseline for the work. I want to just um, quickly close up here first with just thanking both of our presenters, all three of our presenters today. Um, for joining us and for sharing your, your programs, your insights, um, challenges, and successes. Um, next steps for us here is if participants could um, please complete the follow-up survey. Um, I know we had way more questions than we had time to answer. We had over 30, I think, um, questions come through. We answered just a handful of them. We will um, see how we can kind of condense those and um, respond to them in some way. So please continue to share your insights and ideas and questions with us. 
Um, of course, I uh, hope you are motivated to take action based on some of what you heard here today, both from your other colleagues on the call, as well as uh, from our presenters. And please stay engaged to learn how to move upstream. Uh, looking forward to hearing from you all. Um, hope you follow Health Begins on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much.